Fidel Castro started a tour of different countries, presenting himself as a Democrat. He started in the United States, then Canada, Brazil, and other South American countries evoking this official visit that started April 15, 1959. They would arrive in Washington, D.C., where they had a very busy schedule planned. His entourage was made up of 40 people and were divided in two airplanes, one from the Rebel Army and the other the Bristol Britannia, which would transport the Prime Minister. When they arrived in Washington, he would improvise a press conference at the Cuban Embassy, where he would eventually lodge in. He greeted the crowd that had gathered together in front of the diplomatic mission. Many days of social activity and public relations were ahead of him. Between lunches with the Secretary of State, Foster Duels, and sharing and chatting with kids, students, cab drivers, and newspaper salesmen on the streets who all wanted to take a picture with Fidel. He did press conferences for the Editor's Society of Washington. He had meetings and luncheons with reporters of different media, with economic advisors. He toured several universities, among them the University of Columbia. He visited the United Nations headquarters, where he held a lecture and a luncheon with diplomatic correspondents. He visited Lincoln Memorial and had a very significant visit at the Capitol, where Fidel interviewed with Vice President Richard Nixon. He also held a press conference in the home of New Jersey's governor, Robert Maynard, among other public activities. Later, he traveled to Brazil, Buenos Aires, and Uruguay. This trip lasted 25 days away from his home. In each country, he presented himself as an advocate for democracy, human rights, and liberty. After his tour, Fidel Castro immediately began to practice politics with socialist ideals that included the agrarian reform and the expropriation of property of the American companies. Castro was in power much longer than any other leader of any other country, with the exception of Queen Elizabeth II. He became an international personality whose importance surpassed that of what would be expected of a head of state for a nation that only had 11 million people. On January 8, 1959, Castro made his triumphal entrance in Havana aboard a jeep. It was at this moment that the impeachment of Fulgencio Batista was consolidated when Fidel gave his first speech before hundreds of thousands of fans at the military headquarters of the defeated dictator. Castro had fans and critics equally, in Cuba and all over the world. For many, he was a ruthless tyrant who went above rights and liberties. Others praised him like they did that first night as a revolutionary hero. Cuba was living through great moments in its eventful revolution. For this reason, he solicited Venezuelan counsel in the restructuring of his army. This counsel was to be provided by Rear Admiral Wolfgang Larrazaba Lugueto, who would be traveling to Havana on and off. That same year in Havana, Venezuelan sea captain Hector Abdelnour arrived in Cuba. It had been known that he was there as a guest of the government, led by Dr. Urrutia, to have conversations related to the restructuring plans of the Cuban army. Those ties that bonded Cuba and Venezuela were the freedom of the nations and the construction of a country with democracy. Venezuela felt identified with these values and it was why they held Cuba in such high regard. This is why Fidel Castro visited Venezuela after Batista's overthrow. After the overthrowing and being free from Batista's dictatorship and corruption, the Cuban leader makes his first trip to Venezuela. Captain Abdel Noor was assigned as a personal aid for the organization and dealings with Castro. This took place on January 25, 1959, 22 days from Batista's fall. Fidel Castro went to Venezuela in search of petroleum for Cuba. The rebel chief, Dr. Fidel Castro, arrived at Maiquetia International Airport in the city of Maiquetia, in the outskirts of Caracas. A crowd calculated at 100,000 people awaited his arrival in Venezuela. He was greeted by Luis Beltran Prieto and Wolfgang Larrazabal, ex-president of the governing board. This was a little after the revolution's triumph that changed the course of Cuba's history 
and that marked a difference in contemporary history in Latin America. Their leader, Fidel Castro, made his first visit to Venezuela and it coincided almost to the day with the anniversary of the end of the dictatorship of Marcos Pérez Jiménez. The leader kindly greeted the crowd and like we mentioned earlier, the person in charge of following through and guaranteeing Castro's movements during his visit was Captain Hector Abdel Noor, who had been nominated his personal aide. Like every order he had received, Captain Abdel Noor followed this one precisely. Deputy Domingo Alberto Rangel, representative for the Democratic Party, gave the welcome speech at the National Convention, praising Crescencio Perez, Cuban symbol of the revolution, which he liked to call peasant. He also called Fidel Venezuela's son, for Venezuela is mother of liberators. Later that night, the president-elect, Mr. Romulo Betancourt, welcomed to his home the maximum leader of the Cuban Revolution, Dr. Fidel Castro. They held a private conference to which the only other witness in attendance was Cuban ambassador, Dr. Francisco Prividal. Betancourt received him with this phrase, you shouldn't have come armed to my quetilla. Fidel had arrived with the July 26 movement, a Cuban political and military organization informally created by him. This was one of the most important organizations among the ones that participated in the Cuban Revolution. In this visit, Fidel Castro was joined by his brother, Raúl Castro, writer, journalist, and Argentine revolutionary Che Guevara, Camilo Cienfuegos, one of the founders of the rebel army known as the Commander of the People. All of these men saw Venezuela with great enthusiasm, and they all shared the same values. A year before, the Venezuelans had overthrown dictator Pérez Jiménez, and during 1958 had lent a political and military hand to the guerrillas, to the government, as well as to the left-wing parties, among them the Democratic Party. Betancourt was enemies with Fulgencio Batista and friends with Cuban leaders like Manuel Urrutia, Osvaldo Torticos, and above all with Raúl Roa. The first two had been presidents of Cuba and the latter had been the famous ambassador to Castro at the United Nations during the Cold War. Fidel was clear that his mission was to get the petroleum supply, but Betancourt explained to him that Venezuela owned the reservoirs, but the production and marketing was controlled by the multinational companies due to concessions they had obtained years before in the authoritarian governments of Gómez, Medina Angarita, and Pérez Jiménez. The new administration was going to begin a policy of no more oil or mineral concessions and would try to convince the Arabs to make an alliance to defend pricing and at the same time, a state petroleum company was to be founded. Due to the circumstances at the time, it was impossible to convene a government-to-government -government exchange between Venezuela and Cuba because Venezuela couldn't nationalize the industry right away. It represented 90% of the income tax and almost 100% of the currency income. Even less so with the financial crisis that was expected due to the flight of capital and debt left behind by Pérez Jiménez. Castro had told Betancourt that he would nationalize Cuban and American companies, and Betancourt recommended, to his recollection, that he do this by compensation or the promise of compensation to reduce the consequences within the United States. Betancourt himself later commented that Castro seemed not to listen to his arguments and kept insisting that Venezuela and Cuba should form an alliance against the United States. And he concludes, this is when I drew the meeting to a close. Castro was very well received in all of Caracas. He got together with kids in the alma mater, which had been closed for two years during the dictatorship due to its talks of liberty. In that moment, the university was taken as a democratic symbol in Venezuela. During his visit, he went to many emblematic places and important meetings. He also visited Captain Hector Abdelnour's home, where he was invited for lunch and shared with his family. Fidel decided to do this as a sign of gratitude 
since the captain had been assigned the task of tending to him once before. Due to the polarization caused by the Cold War, the media used this to elaborate a dossier of execution against Captain Abdel Noor. Castro returned to Cuba and pulled an ace out of his sleeve, Soviet Petroleum. In 1960, this pact caused the multinational petroleum companies to cut the supplies from the Venezuelan reservoirs. The United States put on the pressure and supported a frustrated attempt to invade Cuba. This led Castro to radicalize his position and solicit help from the USSR. Even though the outcome of the missile crisis in 1962 ensured the existence of the revolution, it also undermined its independence, leaving the country aligned with Soviet orbit. In 